Coming up on DTNS, are you surprised that Huawei built a spy network in North Korea? DoorDash continues to keep its driver's tips and picking a fight with the AI on fire. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 22nd, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And from a sweltering L.A. County area, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We just had a wonderful conversation about uh, appreciating flight attendants and uh, the salt content of V8. Uh, if you want Good Day Internet, the expanded show where you get a little more of us letting our hair down, uh, you can subscribe and become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The FTC announced a settlement with Equifax over its 2017 data breach that exposed personal and payment information on 147 million Americans, Canadians, and British nationals. Equifax will pay at least $575 million, submit to third-party assessments every two years, and invest $1 billion to improve security. The fine could reach up to $700 million, with up to $425 million to compensate consumers and pay for credit protection services for those affected. $175 million paid to 48 states and $100 million to the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. If this sounds like a lot of money, well, the settlement marks the largest fine ever levied by the FTC. Ah, no more need to control shift escape or use that activity monitor to find out how much of your memory slack is taken up because the latest update for Windows and Mac OS claims to launch 33% faster and use 50% less RAM than before. Slack won't create a standalone copy for each workspace as it's done in the past, which is one of the reasons it ate into all your RAM. Kenya has launched the largest wind power farm on the African continent, surpassing those in Morocco, Ethiopia, and South Africa, already in business. The Lake Taronka window power farm will generate around 310 megawatts from 365 turbines and increase the country's electricity supply 13%. Around 70% of Kenya's national electricity currently comes from renewable sources like hydropower and geothermal. WhatsApp released its app for Chaos phones, that's uh, KaiOS, uh, which is used on phones like the Nokia 8110. Previously, it had been released only on select phones like Geophone in India. The app can be downloaded from the Kai store on phones with at least 256 megabytes of RAM and includes the ability to text and make voice calls along with end-to-end -end encryption, so it's got the basics. It'll come pre-installed on some Chaos phones starting in Q3. Asus announced the ROG Phone 2 with a 6.59-inch 1080p OLED display at 120 hertz that supports 10-bit HDR and claims 49 milliseconds touch response time. Inside the ROG Phone 2 has a Snapdragon 855 Plus, 12 gigs of RAM, and up to 512 gigabytes of internal storage, a 48-megapixel camera, and a 6,000 milliamp battery. The ROG Phone 2 global model will launch in the first week of September, although... No pricing announced as of yet. All right, let's talk a little more about Microsoft sinking a billion dollars into OpenAI. Remember, OpenAI no longer a nonprofit. It's a capped profit company. So a certain amount of money can be paid back to investors while OpenAI itself remains nonprofit. Uh, OpenAI uh, is getting the money from Microsoft to help develop artificial general intelligence. That's Come sometimes now abbreviated as AGI. It's an AI that can do things on its own without being supervised on what to do. It can be widely uh, uh, applied to widely distributed economic benefits, among other things. As part of the investment, the two companies will develop new AI technologies for Azure, and OpenAI will train and run AI models on Azure, while OpenAI will license technology to Microsoft to commercialize and sell to partners. A uh, significant move for OpenAI in that it doesn't want to sell products. Uh, it needs more money, as do all that DeepMind does too. As AI becomes more powerful, it needs more computing resources, and those computing resources get more and more expensive. So this solves two problems for, for OpenAI. They don't have to go and try to sell things uh, because they're going to get this money from Microsoft. They get to use some of Microsoft Azure resources, uh, which gives them some computing resources to run their experiments and allows them to keep that capped profit model so that they continue to meet the mission, which is to try to safely develop AI so that it benefits humanity.
Yeah, one of my questions when I when I read the story was, okay, it's called OpenAI. Understood that it, it is a capped profit company and there is more capital needed to make sure that the company continues to 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 evolutionize what they're doing. Got it. Does anybody feel like this is a sellout kind of a situation uh working with Microsoft? Obviously, Microsoft benefits very much and OpenAI it, Open AI is very, you know, it, it's, 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 it, it is, it is an effort that, uh, that many in the industry think is, 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 is a good one. Well, yeah, I think a lot of people have hoped that open AI would provide a safe route to handle AI and get its benefits, uh, especially people like Elon Musk who worry about AI if it is done wrong. And that's one of the reasons Elon Musk is giving money to open AI, but it's a great question. When open AI went to the capped profit model, a lot of people were very upset about that because it lessened the purity of its of its nonprofit uh, mission. I wonder if Microsoft joining this makes that worse or not, or if it's like, no, they, you know, when they did cap profit, we knew stuff like this would happen. At least it's Microsoft this not time and not another a com not a worse company. Uh, I don't know. If you have a thought on how you feel about Microsoft dropping a billion dollars into open AI, send us an email, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Analyst Ben Schachter noticed that the dating app Tinder launched a new default payment process in its Android app that bypasses the Google Play payment system. Users instead directly enter their credit card information into the app itself. Once it's entered, the option to choose Google Play as a payment method is removed. In an email statement, Match Group spokeswoman Justine Sacco stated, quote, we will always try to provide options that benefit the user experience and offer payment options is one example of this. Yeah, this is a, this is a, a very interesting test case for the Google Play model. As we all know, everybody's frustrated with Apple because they say you use our payment model and give us 30% or 15% in some cases, or you can't have subscriptions or payments at all in your app. Uh, the alternative is to take all your subscriptions and payments as Amazon does on the web, and then they can show up in your app, which is not good for consumers. Google Play has never done that, but at the same time, a lot of companies have just continued to use the Google Play payment system because they liked it. Tinder's pushing that boundary. And I'll be curious if this works for Tinder, Will more companies start to offer their own payments within? Will Google then be tempted to go more the Apple route and crack down on that? Uh, or will it not really catch on and people realize it's you know nicer not to have to build it yourself? And would that affect Apple? If, if they showed like, look, you can let people take their own payments and most people won't because they don't want to have to deal with it. I mean, my first question is, what is Tinder charging for? I don't know. It's probably some, <laughs> oh, <laughs> some, some plus. I figured model you would that... know that. I assume they charge like for for membership perks. Well, I don't. Isn't there some um, Tinder yeah, premium there, there's thing? usually or yeah, you 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 you're able to reach somebody and it it in a different Does it way. Increase your number of matches have... you can look at at a Perhaps. time. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You, you. It probably just sort of widens the widens the. Uh, the pool the 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 eventual pool yes of tinder folks that you might be talking to but yeah this is it, it it's interesting and we do talk about the you know the apple model of this and companies trying to get around it every so often so yeah it's interesting to see but how 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 this will play out for tinder uh thromald says you might be able to go back to someone you said no to and change your mind if you pay oh yeah uh -huh. that Interesting. Been there, Thrumwald. Been there. <laughs> uh, the Washington Post and North Korean analysis site 38 North published a joint report claiming that Huawei partnered with Chinese government-owned Panda Information Technology to build the North Korean cell phone network Koryolink back in 2008. Huawei apparently provided the network equipment and uh, managed uh, some of the management systems and encryption systems uh, of Coriolink, while Panda provided the software and actually took the gear into North Korea. Coriolink prevents domestic users from reaching the internet or making international calls, while interestingly, foreign visitors to North Korea are prevented from making local calls or viewing the state-run internet. So people in North Korea get one thing, 
people from outside North Korea get an entirely different thing. It does use Huawei supported interception gateways to intercept calls, text, data, and faxes for, they think, around 5,000 targets, although it could be more. Huawei says it has no business presence in North Korea. And uh, in fact, the ZTE supported Kang Song network is much larger in North Korea. Huawei may have included US made gear in that equipment, though, maybe some chips, you know, some boards. If that gear made up more than 10% of a device, it would have violated US export rules. So there's a question about that. Meanwhile, Huawei told Yahoo Finance it expects to ship 270 million phones this year and become the world's second largest phone maker. So it does not seem to be daunted by the restrictions placed on it by the US, which seem to be being eased right now. But going back to this Washington Post story, my first reaction had been, well, somebody had to, I mean, if North Korea has a cell phone network, someone had to build it. And it's not a shocker to me that the someone who built it was a Chinese company because China's kind of North Korea's only ally. Uh, yes, there's a question of if they had more than 10% of US content in those devices, uh, that could be a violation of, of trade policy. But it's not shocking or even controversial to me that Huawei would build a North Korean network. I do think that the idea that they created some intercept technology would be interesting to know for sure, because that would be our first clear evidence that Huawei has developed that technology, that kind of backdoor technology for its devices that people fear it could use in other parts of the world. Yeah, I mean, it, the whole Huawei plus North Korea together, you know, makes for a lot of panic, right? Uh, but if 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 there is a bunch of hardware that was provided to the North Korean government, right, uh, which is what is running most of North Korea as far as uh, telecoms go, then sure, it has to come from somewhere. Uh, the fact that it's Huawei is, you know, it, it's easy for people to say, well, you know, now, now, now look at Huawei's doing. But if there is not a back and forth going on with, with, yes, uh, what these, these, uh, uh, um, variety of, of hardware equipment could do, then I, I'm not sure why it's a huge deal. I, I, I guess it's a, a huge deal if it breaks trade law. And it could be a huge deal if it, in fact, uh, they developed something specifically for North Korea that could be used well, elsewhere. Exactly, exactly. If they, if, if that's what happened, well, that's different. But the fact that there's equipment in the in the country itself, not sure that it is cause for um, for outrage at this point. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, Panda Information Technology, which is state owned is the one that did all the configuration. They they created the software. It's sure. as likely as not that Panda did the intercept technology and, and Huawei just made it possible. I don't know if that makes you feel better or not, but uh, most of the stuff that would be really controversial for Huawei to do could have been done by Panda. Since Panda said, look, we're just gonna buy the equipment from Huawei. And we'll take it into the country and get it all set up for you. Yeah, I, and at the risk of sounding like some sort of like Huawei apologist, you know, I don't know what's going on here. Um, I'm trying yeah. to think of like what is the what what is the scenario that is that is least upsetting to everybody. Yeah, and what know? what what is actually going on instead of yeah. uh, jumping on something and saying like, oh, because it has this name in it, uh, we must panic. Uh, let's let's wait and and not panic unless we have a reason to panic. And I don't know that there's too much reason to panic here. There are a couple of points for concern though. And I think that's worth paying attention to. Speaking of panic, well, potential panic anyway, China's mm. ByteDance, maker of TikTok, perhaps you've heard of it, plans to open a data center in India to address concerns over Indian user data, particularly from TikTok users being stored in overseas places such as Singapore and the US TikTok has more than 300 million users in India. Now, India's Ministry of Information and Technology has asked ByteDance to explain how it collects that user data. TikTok was briefly banned in India in April, you might remember that, by a court directive that was shortly overturned. Yeah, there's there's a whole political aspect of this involving the ruling party and some feelings of nationalism and whether and how that's feeding TikTok. There's also just the generalized fear of what the new technology is doing to our kids that uh, happens in every country uh, regarding TikTok and, and other social networks. Uh, so it's a kind of a complex situation. It'll be interesting to see if merely opening a data center in India and saying, great, we won't store your data overseas. It's all going to be here under your government's control. 
helps to dampen that. TikTok, I mean, ByteDance had a big win when they got that court directive overturned because it looked pretty bad for them when they when they got banned originally. So they must have some sway and influence uh, to get treated fairly, if if that's any indication. It's also it, it's interesting that you know I, I I sort of liken this, and I know I'm an old person, so TikTok is not really in my wheelhouse these days. But I think about you know a social network that's hot with the kids uh, in the U.S. Nobody is like, hey, is the data center not in the U.S.? That's what we're worried about. It's more of like kids are doing crazy things on social networking and parents can't keep track of it. So the the fact that this is something that could perhaps, uh, you know, sort of squash some, 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 some upset feelings over TikTok is really interesting. Yeah. I mean, we don't worry about the data center not being in the U S because they're almost always in the U S. Uh, if we had a <laughs> bunch of data stored in data centers in China or Russia, you bet you'd have the same kind. All of right. Thing. Well, yeah, that's a really yeah. good point then. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's something that, you know, we, we luckily haven't worried about, but, but I also think that a lot of this sort of, you know, what is the youth doing on these mm-hmm. social networks and, and older people, you know, get, you know, feeling like, well, you know, there's 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 a lot of data being thrown around and we're a little bit worried about it and we'd like it to be uh, more internal to make us feel better is yeah. something that we're going to hear more and more about. Yeah, I mean, and you're hearing that happen in Europe where they're saying we need data of Europeans not to be stored in the United States because we don't trust uh, what companies are doing with it there. Same thing in Brazil. You've heard that. So that that is less of a part of this. It is a part of it. Uh, and, I, and I wonder if just moving it into India helps with those other fears of like this, what is this doing to our kids? That more conservative aspect of it. New York Times reported Andy Newman became a, or I'm sorry, New York Times reporter Andy Newman became a food delivery person for several services in New York City to see what it was like. I, I love this kind of journalism. Uh, George Plimpton, <laughs> yeah. of course, made it famous by becoming a Detroit Lion and playing football and all that. On the sort ground, of thing. delivering yeah. food. So yeah. he really did like, all right, I'm going to try this. I'm going to see what it's like. Uh, among the many things he confirmed is uh, that same thing we reported back in March. I, I actually didn't remember it, but Sarah did. March 8th, that DoorDash keeps its driver's tips in some cases. Newman found, uh, and he writes, here's how it works. If the woman in the bathrobe had tipped zero, DoorDash would have paid me the whole $6.85. That's what he was going to get paid for this delivery. Because she tipped $3, DoorDash kicked in only $3.85. She was saving DoorDash $3, not tipping me. Uh, This is what's called a tipped wage. It's a practice used by many bars and restaurants to pay workers less than minimum wage since they can expect to make it up in tips. NBC News and the Los Angeles Times previously reported how Instacart and Amazon Flex also use tips to make up pay. Instacart has since ended that policy. Uh, The Verge confirmed that Postmates, Grubhub, Seamless, and Uber Eats all say they do not use tips to subsidize pay. And there is a class action lawsuit. That's what we reported on back in March 8th. Uh, between DoorDash delivery drivers and DoorDash over that policy. And DoorDash is holding to it. They say it's a uh, standard way to do it. They don't always use the tip to subsidize the fee. They say that most drivers don't mind. I don't know if I believe that. Maybe they don't mind because they don't know what's happening. I don't know. Uh, But it definitely makes me, A, not really want to use DoorDash, which I don't really use anyway because I've had some other problems with them. Uh, And B, if I were to use DoorDash, I want to chip cash and maybe I'll start tipping cash anyway for these places. Yeah. And this whole kind of shared economy thing, just because it's exploded so much. And I am a person who, I mean, I get delivery to my house several times a week. Not even going to lie. This is, this is something that is, I don't know if it's enhanced my life, but it certainly made it more convenient. So, um, and, 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 and many times, uh, the you know the folks that you're you're looking at them on your phone you're watching the route that they take by the time they get to your house half the time you feel like you already know them you know you want your food and everything so the 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 idea that a DoorDash a courier could be like well that doesn't make sense and some very very like for the end user some competing services aren't doing this. You, I, I wonder how much DoorDash is going to 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 feel sort of a bleed away of of their workforce. I'm not I'm not a big believer in in calling for legislation every time there's a problem. I, I think that we should always try other ways to fix things because it's more elegant and more permanent. Uh, and laws have a bad way of not adapting with the times. But I do think it might be worth considering legislation that says 
transparency. If a tip is made, uh, the end user should know who gets the tip and the driver should know whether they're getting a tip. Because what happens here is they don't really know unless the person tells them whether a tip was made or not. Uh, and, or if they get one and few people tip these delivery drivers anyway. So maybe it doesn't matter, uh, to drivers much, but I kind of think, I kind of guess it does. I am a tipper. I, I understand that, that there are a lot of reasons that people tip the way that they tip and, and that's, mm -hmm. that's fine. I cannot live with myself if I'm given the option to like, you know, press the button for a 15% tip for that ramen that the Uber Eats guy just, just uh, delivered to me with a smile. I'm going to do that. The fact that a company might take that from the driver, that is something that I feel like is going straight to the driver because I am trying to be, you know, a, a good citizen and, and I thank uh, him or her for, for doing their job. Um, yeah. and, and knowing that it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's somewhat thankless job as you mentioned. So yeah, I, 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 I understand that DoorDash has its reasons for saying, well, you know, this is why we do it. And, and don't worry about it. But hmm, if you were a driver and I, again, if you have the option to maybe just drive for a different company who doesn't have the same policies. I, I, I don't understand why you wouldn't if it bothered you. Yeah. And, and maybe there doesn't need to be legislation. Maybe I should just as a consumer say, look, I'm only going to use uh, the, the companies that make it clear who gets the tips uh, and, and post that right out front. Make, make me know, because it's one thing when I leave a few dollars on a tray and I see the waiter take it away, I know she's got that money. Now, maybe she's not allowed to keep it. Maybe she's not, but at least I know she sure. knows I tipped her. Right. Whereas with these computers, yeah, the whole point is I don't want to have to carry cash around. I can do it all in my app, but if the driver doesn't even know that I tipped them, well, that's no good. Uh, so yeah. no, yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's a goodwill measure in many cases. It's not even really about the money. It's the fact that you're like, being like, thank you very much. This is yeah. a thank you measure. Totally. Uh, and places in the world that don't have tipping. Well, yes, you can send your snide <laughs> comments about why it's so much better where you live and you'd be justified. That's fine. You probably also use the magic system. <laughs> well, yes, because most of the world does. <laughs> Correct. Right. Let's talk about baseball. Shall yes. we? The unaffiliated Atlantic League Baseball Organization has been testing using TrackMan, that's an AI, to call balls and strikes. Something that's very popular in baseball if you're not familiar with the game. The test is part of a three-year deal with Major League Baseball to learn how it works for eventual consideration in the majors. Now, in its first game test, High Point Rockers pitching coach Frank Viola Jr. Sounds like very much a pitching coast name, was ejected for arguing that human empire Tim Detweiler should have overrode the computer calls, which he had the authority to do. Uh, York Revolution's Ryan Dent had walked on five pitches, three of which were on the edge of the strike zone as well. Yeah, so uh, Frank Viola Jr. getting into a, getting not only just getting into an argument, but getting ejected, and then going on Twitter and saying, uh, "This this is great. I believe in this technology, but we should get it right before we put it uh, in a real game." Well, I mean, that's why they're trying it in the Atlantic League. No disrespect yeah. to the Atlantic League, but you have to start trying it somewhere. K Zone and Statcast have have been doing this for a long time on television, so it's time to try it in some games. And yours was the game they tried it in. That said, the next web showed a representation of where those balls were, and they were right on the edge. Mm -hmm. I don't know why umpire Detweiler did not override at least one of those that looks like it's actually in the strike zone, because that's how we improve the accuracy of these things is we get the, the agreement, right? I always, uh, I <laughs> full disclosure, I always kind of like secretly have wanted to be an umpire yeah, because I don't understand how people get these jobs. And I know that it, it requires, a, you know, good hand-eye coordination and, 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 and really following a game very closely. That said, you, you know, there's so much about sports and it, it varies between the sports, right? Baseball's, Baseball has a certain rules, basketball, football, uh, and and so on and so forth, um, where there are a certain amount of challenges. And sometimes the umpire is law. What they say goes, even if the crowd is booing and, you know, throwing things at the field type thing. AI 
And, and again, I don't want to, you know, upset anybody by saying, well, umpires are, you know, they're, they're, their days are numbered, but this seems like a great situation for something to be not disputed. It, it is or it isn't. Yeah. I mean, anything where the question is not uh, a judgment call, the question is, was it actually inside or outside tennis? For example, was that, did that ball hit the line or was it out? Right. Uh, and we can know that with more accuracy than ever with cameras and sensors, uh, just put that in the hands of computers. It will be right more often. I I I, I agree with that. Uh, it's a little weird with the strike zone where the the definition of the strike zone is over the plate between the letters uh, and the waist, and you know where the letters are. I mean, it's actually the where the uh, right. you know, bottom of the armpit and is. And it depends but, on the body types so of the pitcher exactly. and it, the yeah. It's an attempt to approximate uh, a hittable ball versus a non-hittable ball. Right. To say like, well, generally, if it's in this area, it's probably hittable. I, I submit that at some point we're going to get away from like, well, let's have an AI that can tell whether it's in this def definition or not. You could actually train a machine learning algorithm whether a ball was hittable or not and 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 redefine right. what a ball in a strike and is. add all that data of body types into that equation right to say like oh this guy's six one uh with his knees up yeah. here like that's a hittable yeah, ball he bats for him. left even yeah, if it's a, he's got a long reach so maybe it's off the plate a little bit right like i i don't know if we want to go down that road but i do think these definitive things probably will be computerized at some point because Humans are fallible. If it's a judgment call, like a balk or something and that, that sort of stuff, that's different. And I think we should always have human umpires on the scene to make a judgment about the computer judgments. The computers to just do the easy stuff. And sure. that's why I'm so disappointed with umpire Detweiler here is that it looks like he should have been like, no, 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 I'm going to overrule that. I'm going to make the human call. I, th I think he should have. It would have been precedent setting if he had. Yeah, Detweiler. No, I mean, who knows? I haven't heard his side of the story. Maybe, maybe the sun got in his computer. I, I mean, I still want to be a, a national uh, baseball umpire. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that I will, I'll get there eventually. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm saying you shouldn't replace the umpires. You should just have no, them in charge yes. of the system. Like any, like you don't expect a pilot to fly your plane manually anymore because the computer can do so many parts of it without, but you don't want that pilot removed from the cockpit yet. Right. You want him to be able to step in. That's what the umpire in a much less, uh, self-driving uh, cars, anyone situation, right? Human Same drivers, idea. Right? You know, yeah. did, does anybody really want no human interaction? No, we still, we still want some of that to yeah. make sure that, you know, that, 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 that we're, that we're being safe, but we are moving in that direction. Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, you got to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Sometimes there are baseball stories. Many times there are non-baseball stories, but we welcome them all. Submit your stories and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Help us make our lineup every day. Thank you in advance. Everybody who hangs out on our Facebook group, thank you. And if you're not part of our Facebook group, please join it. Facebook.com slash groups slash Daily Tech News Show. Let's check out the mailbag. You know, it's funny. Uh, our mailbag comes from Twitter today, Tom. Vargas hmm. uh, underscore I, uh, AIE rather says, I really enjoyed the DTNS with Professor, Professor Lepowski. I'm an engineer from my state's DEP and deal with landfills and e-waste daily. The rules for landfilling e-waste varies greatly state to state, and he gave a great overview of the issue. Yeah, if you missed that, uh, it was in the regular feed uh, back a couple weeks ago. I, I'll have a link to it in the show notes as well. Uh, it's a great listen. Uh, and Professor Leposki is really good at explaining what is important with e-waste and what you may have a misimpression about based on coverage that was either exaggerated or just old. Uh, there's some coverage that was perfectly legitimate 10 years ago, but the system isn't like that anymore. So uh, if you're like, wait a minute, what is going on with e-waste? What should we be paying attention to? Uh, the, the whole thing about mountains of circuit boards in, in foreign countries is not the story anymore. Uh, and you got to listen to that, dailytechnewsshow.com. Thanks to our patrons for making the show possible. Tom. Yes. Tom, where, 
How, how do we thank them adequately enough? We don't, uh, but we try. We give them all <laughs> kinds of perks uh, and we thank them at the end of the show. And uh, if you want to become a patron, uh, we will thank you. Uh, you. It means the world to us. Uh, and it's a dollar a month out of your pocket for you. And uh, if, if that's not that much to you, uh, it would help us tremendously. You'll get exclusive episodes. You'll get insights. You'll get into our Discord where you can chat with other folks. Uh, it's all there at patreon.com slash DTNS. And whether you're a patron or not, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts in our survey. Uh, we've had 330 of you take it. Thank you to the 330 of you who have taken it. That's not most of you by any stretch. So uh, yeah, just take a couple of minutes and let us know what you think. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash survey. And if you have feedback for us, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Keep that feedback coming. We'd love to hear it. We're also live. If, if you can join us Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC, you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Shannon Morris. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>